All right, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series. Uh, this is a Sunday night edition. Tonight's topic is Grand Rounds, Improving Eye Care and Outcome for Patients with our speaker, Dr. Greg Caldwell. He's a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. We also completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Eye Institute in Philadelphia. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, and a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and a member of the Opt Optometric Wellness and Nutrition Society. He currently works in Duncansville, PA, as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment active disease, and he's been a participant in multiple FDA clinical trials. He's integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care and practices integrative optometry. He's a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook. He's lectured extensively throughout the country in over 13 countries internationally, in 2010, he served as president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 through 2016. He is, a pre he is president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with it, it's my great privilege and pleasure to welcome my partner to speak for the next hour and 40 minutes on Grand Rounds, Improving Eye Care and Outcome for the Patients. Greg, please take it away. Thanks, Joe. And you can still hear me, correct? I can. All right, perfect. All right, so everyone, every time we do a COPE approved uh, lecture to go through disclosures, the content of this activity, this presentation was prepared by me. There's a laundry list of people that I've lectured for and did advisory boards. It's just there, take a look at it. I might mention some of those companies tonight. I'm not showing any bias. And the, the list is long and really because, you know, if I'm going to try and teach and try and bring good updated information to the to the to the audience, then these are the companies that I interact with. I don't really put that up there to show off, but just to just to make sure that we're constantly bringing you the updated information. I don't have any financial interest or proprietary interest in any of the companies mentioned. Uh, I do have a non-salaried financial affiliation with Pharmanex. That means basically they pay me for nutraceuticals that are sold. Uh, Involve, uh, I sit as the PA medical director uh, as the, uh, and I sit on the credentialing committee for there. I also am the chairman of the advisory council for diabetes and macular degeneration for the healthcare registries. And then this is probably the most important bullet is that the content and the format of this course will be presented without any commercial bias and doesn't claim any superiority of any commercial product or service. So uh, I'll probably be mentioning a lot of companies during this talk. You'll be seeing a lot of printouts. And again, nothing is biased here. And uh, I am half owner of Optometric Education Consultants. So real quick, right off the bat, Joe, I'm not sure if you have them opened up. I have them here. I will do it for you, Greg. Thank you. Uh, here's a patient with a central retinal artery occlusion. It happened, you know, today the patient said they woke up, they just couldn't see. Um, you bring them in, you see this nice cherry red spot going on. And uh, uh, what do you do? Uh, do, you, do you refer uh, for uh, anterior chamber paracentesis? Or we uh, have the patient breathe into that, our favorite brown paper bag, as Joe likes to say, it has to be brown. It can't be red or yellow or just a brown paper bag. We order or refer for stat blood workup because we're concerned about GCA or are we referring to the emergency room and preferably a stroke ready hospital. And we've been doing this, you know, since this kind of came out, maybe there's something new. Uh, and it's pretty neat here, Joe, to see that uh, looks like the word is getting out on what we're supposed to be doing with these patients now. Yeah, I think the secret is out, fortunately. All right. I think that's a pretty good sampling of what's happening out there. So I'm just going to share the results. 
So you'll see here that, uh, you know, refer for paracentesis, you know, the brown paper bag is, you know, we have a few people out there, you know, refer for GCA, probably not a bad idea, but uh, what we do now with these patients is we can see about 70% of the people uh, have got, you know, have mentioned refer to a stroke uh, ready hospital. And uh, Joe, you know, you'll be participating in this one because you certainly were helpful and this is, you know, kind of a new public service announcement and maybe not so much now um, since 70% uh, are there, but, you know, play co pay close attention. Basically a 65 year old man reports sudden vision loss. Vision is now count fingers. It happened, you know, this morning it's painless and he's got a grade four afferent pupillary defect. And as we saw a little bit earlier, you know, we have this you know, which this is a, uh, this is a central retinal artery occlusion. And really this is the largest cotton wool spot that you'll ever see. Uh, you can see here that you have this cherry red spot because there's really no nerve fiber layer uh, in the uh, Mac or in that foveal area uh, <clears throat> to create that whitening. <coughs> that, that's, that's there. You can see here, it's just a nice cherry red spot. You know, here's the other eye. So what is the treatment for this? You know, in the past, we talked about anterior chamber paracentesis, if it was less than 24 hours, just like this one is, you know, stat blood work, you know, this person's 65, really anyone over age 50. We always have to be thinking in the back of our mind, giant cell arteritis. You know, that, that blood work would be a sed rate, a C-reactive protein, we'd be looking at a complete uh, blood count with differential, checking out the platelets, checking out uh, uh, gonna, this person, uh, and checking out all these uh, findings just to make sure that, you know, maybe the patient, uh, uh, make sure the patient doesn't have giant cell arteritis, and then you'd monitor for neovascularization. You know, that has changed. Um, that has changed to where now for central retinal artery, branch retinal artery, uh, transient ischemic attack. And, you know, I still have here amaurosis fugax. And Joe, this is kind of like your specialty here. You know, what's the, what's the appropriate words that we're supposed to be doing for these people? Is it transient ischemic or what are we, what are we supposed to call the, that person? It's a transient ischemic attack. Uh, amaurosis fugax or flitting blindness is really an old and inappropriate term because it has a connotation uh, of being benign, and it really isn't. You know, a person who has had a, a, a sudden hemifield or total field black out of vision in one eye, and it's very, very, you know, you got to be very good on the history because you usually see nothing. They have that. That is a stroke risk. You know, that is a transient ischemic attack. And that is that does pretend some potential morbidity. So we got to get away from amaurosis fugax, and that called a retinal TIA or ocular TIA or ocular stroke. We call it a TIA. Perfect. And we can see here that you know an acute stroke ready hospital goes through certification recognize, you know, the hospital meets standards. I'm not going to read that whole list to you, but, you know, what I did, and you can see uh, what comes up here, I did Pennsylvania and stroke-ready hospitals, and there's different levels. You know, there's kind of entry level to stroke-ready hospital to full-blown stroke-ready hospitals out there. Um, luckily, um, you know, this has gotten pretty easy. Someone shows up that day, with a central retinal artery occlusion, branch retinal artery occlusion, or a transient ischemic attack. It's a, it's a right over to the emergency room and uh, uh, stroke ready hospital, really easy uh, workup that day. You know, you warn the hospital if there's suspicion for GCA. So this person is 65, what better place for them to be if, they're not having a stroke or a heart attack, uh, and maybe it is GCA, what better place to be than at the hospital to get the, uh, the, the IV steroids? And really, 20% um, of the stroke or heart attacks are within three years, 
if you see a CRAO, but here's the reason. With that being said, 80% of them happen within the first 24 to 48 hours with 50% occurring within the next two weeks. So the majority in the next 90 days. So when someone has a CRAO, these strokes and heart attacks, you can see are very weighted for the first one to two days. And that's why you want to get them to the, get them to the hospital. You don't send them to the primary care physician. You don't have to send them to the retinologist to get confirmation. You just send them to the stroke ready hospital. But really, you also want to make sure that you call and work with the hospital and let them know what's going on. All right, so acute stroke ready hospital is the basic level, uh, better than not being certified. This was created in 2015. If you, have, uh, if you have access to a primary stroke center, thrombectomy or comprehensive stroke center, you know, you could say that's even better for the patient uh, that's there. There are three different, you know, levels of, of certifications. Again, that comprehensive primary and that acute stroke ready hospital, you know, rather than maybe just the hospital that's out there, someone that comes in. Uh, so my clinical advice would be, patient care is just, you know, when you have a talk like this, right, you're going to probably have someone within the next few weeks show up. Now you know what to do. It's really easy, but just know where your stroke ready hospitals are. And you might already know that. Here's what I did for, uh, for, for Pennsylvania. That's where I'm from. I just did stroke ready hospitals. I found this document by pretty much by County. And you can see here, they have a list of the facility. And you can see how they have it listed here, primary you know, stroke center, comprehensive stroke center, in a sense, that's kind of like your highest level. And you can see lots of primary. And then here's kind of that, if you want to say that, I hate to say entry level, but you know, first level uh, of the acute stroke ready. So you can see lots of primaries in Pennsylvania uh, going down through here. You know, I thought this was pretty neat. Now, using ODs on Facebook, you know, last week I saw an 80-year-old man patient with an acute central retinal artery occlusion. I sent him for that STAT GCA and told uh, him and his daughter that he should have a carotid ultrasound done soon to evaluate the risk of stroke. Uh, I didn't make it, it, didn't make it sound urgent. Unfortunately, he had a stroke the very next day. So this just kind of shows you, and this is back in 2018, but you can see here that, you know, 80% happened within the first 24 uh, to 48 hours. So you know, this was kind of neat. This is right when COVID was starting, right? We, this patient showed up to uh, our office. You can see this is, in a, in a sense, a branch a retinal artery occlusion. And you can see the defect that occurred and my uh, colleague at the practice was texting me. You could see Justin, you know, he's texting me, you know, I'm texting ischemic optic neuropathy or a branch retinal artery occlusion. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. You know, sent Optimap. There's his, uh, you know, did a, we have a way to measure pupils at the practice using an automated instrument for APDs. Um, and so basically, I'm, talking in here somewhere. Uh, that's, that's why or you're right in here. The patient that I saw, because I asked him, I said, hey, what happened to that patient? Because I said, get him off to a stroke ready hospital. That patient that I sent the visual field to uh, with the, uh, the other day had an artery occlusion called had an aneurysm of the carotid artery. Right. So that's why you get them to these stroke ready hospitals, because Really, who knows what's going on for these patients? Uh, you can really help them out. And this is just, you know, why we remained open. This was just during COVID times where we had a, you know, a horseshoe tear and a retinal detachment here going on with this patient. This just happened uh, five days ago. But Joe, before I get into this, I know that, uh, you know, you were the one that kind of introduced me to this. We had uh, Valerie uh, Buis and Nancy Newman. Uh, who kind of really out of Emory um, kind of created this or, found, you know, 
brought this to our attention. If you want to talk maybe a little bit in depth about maybe what I, what I left out there, because I know that you know you know this subject pretty uh, pretty deep. I think I think you're covering things uh, very well. I've only got a couple of a uh, couple polls to put in here. Uh, one going back to the Ambrose Fugax TIA. That that's a tough call because you almost always have to do that by history, and there are many things that can cause transient visual loss, from ocular surface disease to other nonsense or benign things to to migraine prodrome. But you're looking at a person who's like painless complete blackout of vision, not a gray out, but a blackout or a hemi field, superior or inferior. Now, in this image you have here on the left, I can see an emboli. If you examine a patient and you find an emboli, it's more, you know, it is more definitive. But very rarely do you ever get that. You have the history. And it's within a day or two, they need to go to a stroke-ready hospital, as you said, Greg. Now, if you're six or seven days out, it's not quite as clear. And in a situation like that, I may order some imaging myself, not in the acute stage, but after we're, we're out, or I'll work with a primary care physician to do an evaluation once you're that, that six to seven days. But what I always encourage the patient is if this happens again, don't come to me go right to the stroke ready hospital and tell them you're having a stroke, you're lost your vision. Uh, and whenever I send patients, because you mentioned the, the giant cell arteritis part in there, Greg, mm -hmm. whenever I send a person to the ER for something emergent, I give them my cell phone number. I, also, I, give, I give chart notes and I give my cell phone number so that they can they can the, the ER physicians can contact me and we can discuss things if necessary. A couple of things to, uh, to point out. CRAO is no longer a stroke in the eye. The American Heart Association is rewriting their definition to call CRAO a stroke. Not a stroke in the eye, not a risk factor for a stroke, but a stroke. So if they've had a CRAO, they have had a stroke. It's not so clear on BRAO, but they've had a stroke. And another thing to uh, point out, you know, when you showed the initial picture, Greg, the, the cherry red spot, uh, several months ago, something happened, and I saw a, a post on ODs on Facebook of, an I think, an 18-year-old uh, young woman who had, who had a sudden inferior accurate defect and i saw everybody weighing in they're saying diabetic papillopathy there is swelling of the disc the patient has a non-arteritic ischemic neuro and i didn't want to get i wasn't going to get involved in it because once you get involved sometimes things can can get a little uh, a little terse so i stayed away but that was a person greg as you recall practiced by you and they reached out to you personally and then you reached out to me and now we're involved i remember the first thing i told told you was, Greg, it's retinal vascular. The fundus was clear, but it's retinal vascular. And when you saw the patient two days later, you had cherry red spot. Do you remember that? I do. Yep, I do. So remember, early artery occlusions, branch and central, look normal. Sudden loss of vision, painless loss of vision. APD, you know, you're not faking. You can't fake an APD. But frankly... They do look normal initially. And uh, what I did on this one, Joe, this was a typo. So I quickly jumped off. This is um, a patient that just recently came into the practice and I, and I texted you on this and uh, um, you know, patient, uh, I wasn't in the clinic. So these aren't the best photos, but these are what was texted to me. And you can see another one into our practice with a CR, uh, with a CRAO, but you can see the embolus. This is what I thought was kind of cool. You can see the retinal edema 14 days into it. This is just an on FOS. And so, Joe, you know, what do we do for these, right? You said this, you know, the, what, you know, after, you know, four or five days, someone shows up. What do you do for a patient that's 14 days out? <laughs> Well, as I told you, I sent back in the text, I said, needs a workup fast, but not urgent. 
And you can do that with the primary care physician for a general atherosclerotic evaluation and the cardiologist for a cardiac evaluation. But one thing I want to point out is, you, you know, on your OCT there in the middle, Greg, you, you, you can see where the, the, you get the hyperreflectile area. Underneath that, you see that kind of shadowing? Yeah, that's what, that is what a fresh artery occlusion is going to look like. You're going to have that shadowing, or I'm, I'm trying to think if, if I'm using the right term, but you'll have that dark area all the way across from, from edge to edge. And when you see that on an OCT, and a person's got vision loss and APD and that shadowing, you're dealing with an artery occlusion. You know, it's going to be a kind of swollen to begin with. And in a couple of weeks, it's going to be very, very thin. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think shadowing is ter perfectly fine. The coherent light is here. You could call that hyperfluorescent and hypofluorescent, but uh, I think a shadow is, you know, just that light is being absorbed right here. So the coherent light. All right. Now here's the branch retinal artery occlusion uh, and the treatment, as Joe said, it doesn't have to be urgent. You can get them to their primary care doc, get a a, a cardiovascular workup for this patient, uh, you can hold off. Um, it's not a, an immediate referral to the stroke ready hospital. But I also want to make it clear that there's a huge difference between a branch vein occlusion. Nothing has changed with that. Um, you still do your, you know, your workup, follow them up the, the way you would. This is not an emergent so it's it's only the artery occlusions that have to go over to the to the stroke ready hospital. Um, you know these are usually from diabetes and high blood pressure, from chronic you know wear and tear, as opposed to the branch retinal artery occlusions um, or typical or yeah the artery occlusions uh, whether it's central retinal or TIA um, is something embolic and potentially could be leading to something that's a stroke or a heart attack. So wanted to be clear that this. Uh, this does not reply, I guess I type out here, this does not apply to central retinal or to the retinal vein occlusions. All right, Let's see if there's any questions regarding this in the chat box before we move on to a new topic. This is kind of a potpourri of you know, grand rounds tonight that we're going to do, and I don't see anything in the chat box. I'm going to launch this polling question. You know, regarding keratoconus, do you consider it a anterior surface disease, posterior surface disease, or never really thought about it this way. So keratoconus, what's your thoughts on it? Joe, I'm going to try and do something here. Hopefully I don't screw something up. Chat seems empty right now, so we're good, Greg. Yep. All right. Try and switch to the Yeti and Yeti. All right. Joe, can you still hear me? I can hear you. All right. Perfect. I just think maybe playing through my computer, trying to get the sound, might create an echo. All right. We're going to end the poll. Share the results and uh, kind of a nice little, kind of a third, third, and the third. Uh, it was multiple choice, so uh, I allowed a few extras. So I see 41% saying uh, anterior and 35% saying posterior and never thought of it this way. So, okay, so let's, why did I ask that question? Let's dive in. So there's the, oh, I guess I had that animated. So there's the cone that we're talking about. And so case two right here is a patient that has seen three ophthalmologists and optometrists in the past month. Patient complains of this ghost image. He's had four dilated exams, no diagnosis yet. And he's very passionate about this ghost. So basically what has happened is he's looking at the big E. He's like, hey, doc, covering this eye. I look at that big E and there's another E. So that ghost, that shadow. Uh, it's monocular, so that you got to think monocular on this patient. Uh, so he's 2020, doesn't have too much of astigmatism to get him there. Uh, we're looking at the externals, looks pretty good. Slit lamp looks good. 
He's had topography, fluorescein angiography, CAT scan, and MRI. So what, what thoughts do you have whenever you have a ghost image? Now, obviously, you know, I started off a polling question with keratoconus here, but the causes of ghost images, uh, refractive air, uncorrected astigmatism. When it comes to the cornea, you have irregular astigmatism, which could come from EBMD, Salzman nodules, keratoconus, post-keratorefractive uh, uh, post refractive surgery. Uh, it could be LASIK. It could be RK incisions that created uh, that irregular astigmatism. Crystalline lens, opacity, and epiretinal membrane and macular edema. Now, hopefully with, you know, you know five eye docs, hopefully a lot of this stuff, refractive air and so on and so forth would have been, would have been uncovered. So when it comes to these conditions, this would have been a nice polling question. I just thought of it now, but, uh, you know, when it comes to here, like what tissue do you look at? Like what tissue is probably creating this, you know, this issue? And the answer I'm just going to throw out there real quick is probably the cornea. And the reason that I like to give when I give this, you know, in live and in person is that, you know, it's always kind of nice to ask the audience, um, what diopter power is the eye, the total power? And, you know, most of the people will say 60 and they rattle that off. And then I go, well, we look at Ks all day long. Like, what's the average K of someone? And, you know, everyone goes, yeah, 43, 42, 40, somewhere in the 40s, right? So 40 over 60, two thirds of the power comes from the cornea. So it doesn't take much, right? It doesn't take much dry eye or ocular surface disease with some staining to create some vision loss. You know, Ascaris has, you know, with these specialty implants, once that cornea pristine, um, doesn't take much swelling of the cornea to see uh, some drop or, you know, some, some loss of vision. Maybe they don't seem so loss of vision on the snell in a chart, but the patients will complain or a fog or a haze. And that's just because the cornea is two thirds of the power of the eye. So when this scenario comes in, I said, all right, where am I going to start looking? Well, hopefully they found an epiretinal membrane or found some astigmatism or, and so on and so forth. I thought maybe there's maybe something going on in the cornea. So here was his topography. And uh, you're looking at the axial power. So we're kind of looking at the anterior surface here. And I looked at it and I'm like, eh, not liking it, but it's not really kind of lighting me on fire for, for keratoconus. But we have a technology and we have a different technology now in the practice that I am. But uh, the technology here looks at the anterior surface or the anterior float, the posterior surface. And when I started looking at the two and looking at the posterior surface, this was looking a little bit steep. Now, what's cool with this technology is it's a placido disc and optic sections. So it's able to give you kind of an optical pachymeter. And you got to be careful with the optical pachymeter because if there's any opacities or EBMD or swelling, the light will only go as far and bounce back. But this person had a crystal clear cornea. And you can see here that it's measuring in the center 379. Now, I think, you know, oats and the uh, doing pachymetry and knowing that the average cornea is about, say, 540, 550. This person has not had any refractive surgery. So why is, why is it centrally 379? And then here's that keratometric reading. You could see what's happening here is this is starting to bulge forward, creating this thin cornea. And that's why I asked the question, is keratoconus kind of the posterior disease or an anterior disease? It's typically kind of a posterior disease where it starts to bulge forward and then eventually affect that anterior surface. And there is some irregular astigmatism here when you start looking at the numbers a little bit, but it's just very mild. The anterior surface is now becoming involved slightly, but this posterior irregularity, in a sense, is now what's causing this person's uh, uh, ghosting image. 
And this is how I felt. I kind of missed this all along the way of, you know, my career at PCO. And it's probably my fault and it has nothing to do with the professors is that, you know, after I started working with the technology and making the diagnosis and learning about form frost, and that's kind of what this is, or, you know, maybe grade one keratoconus, form frost keratoconus, you hear that word. And where it really comes from, it's a frustrated form of keratoconus. It really just hasn't blossomed yet into a full, in a sense, cone. And this is the the person, the last person you want to do LASIK on, right? Create a flap and and um, and 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 do a laser on this. So I I I do now do some specialty lenses in the practice. Not a lot of docs in the area don't want to do it. I do do some sclerals. Very rarely do I do an RGP. I do have docs in my practice to do that. But I do keep two diagnostic RGPs in my practice. They're both Plano. One's a 39 cornea, and that's for those LASIK patients that come in, maybe have some ghosting image, and I'm trying to figure out maybe they have you know, maybe a little ectasia or a little irregularity from the procedure. And I'll put a 39 on there, you numb their eye and do an over refraction and see if their symptoms have gone away. And the other one is a Plano 44. And so I put one of those lenses on this patient and you know, eliminated the, the ghost image that, that, that the patient was having, which tells me he has a little bit of irregular stigmatism. You know, he really wasn't interested uh, at the time of wearing an RGP. Um, and this was years ago that this case came out. But, you know, if this case was now and I've lost him to follow up, I'm not sure where he ended up. But if I had him now, I'd watch him closely. And if there's any progression or maybe even at this point, get him to a cornea doc to consider uh, cornea crosslinking, because this is rarely where we want to catch, you know, someone with uh, with uh, with uh, with this type of keratoconus in that early stage. <clears throat> where we can stiffen that cornea up and prevent this uh, from turning into a full-blown uh, cone on this patient. Or, you know, you just follow them closely. Maybe they would go to the, uh, to the, to the corneal specialist. The corneal specialist might say, hey, let's keep an eye on it. First sign of progression, let's, uh, let's get, this person, uh, get this person treated. So case three here is just an advanced cone. This is where we would not be doing uh, cornea cross-linking. You can see here, just by looking at the patient, you can see the cone. And just by looking down, you can see the, the Munson sign. You can see how the eyelid is taking on the position of the cone, but you can kind of see how that cornea is taking that cone shape. And here's a bilateral Munson sign. You can see here that the, the, the lid is taking on that shape. But what I really wanted to show you here is what the topography looks like. So I'm a big advocate on, and like I said, I don't care which one you use in the practice, find out, you do the evaluation, but uh, you could see here that that posterior float is so involved and, and bulging forward that now you got your kind of your typical, what we see on your anterior uh, topographies that are out there. You could see here 343 on that optical pachymetry, but you could see what has happened to this keratometric type of reading. Mm -hmm. And the same thing here with the left eye. This is that patient that I just showed you with the bilateral Munson sign. You can see here that that posterior float is bulging so much forward now in the sense that the ectasia of this disease is bulging now affecting the, the uh, anterior float. And you can see here, the pack imageries are thin and the keratometric reading. This would have been a good one for the chat box, but you can just ask yourself, you know, what happens when the posterior cone gets too steep and decimates membrane ruptures, you know? So just kind of think about that. I'll give you a second or two, you know, that, that posterior I'm talking about gets so thin, bulging forward that it, it tears open and what's, you know, what's decimase membrane holding back is aqueous. So aqueous pours into that cornea and that becomes a painful situation. And that's what we call high drops. And uh, what we what we see here is, you know, a patient that has corneodema, um, that posterior float or the posterior part of that cone got so steep that it ruptured. And then this is a painful situation. You know, and this is sometimes where, you know, we might have to manage this by using our DEA number, you know, and using maybe some tramadol 
you know, 50 milligrams because these are pretty painful uh, for the patient or Tylenol and ibuprofen, whatever you feel is appropriate uh, for the patient. I have a quick little video here. Let's see if it, if it plays. I don't think there's any sound to it. Um, this is just wanted to kind of show you just real quick. Um, this is what happens when you get bored and you want to put videos together is that uh, this was a surgeon, Dr. Greenberg, uh, that I try in a sense, if you want to say trained under, uh, he has since retired. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to show you um, just what a cornea can go through. This is a cornea transplant. And uh, this is not for uh, keratoconus. And you'll see here uh, how you can tell is whenever we get to cutting this cornea out, um, is that you'll see that uh, it's a pretty small transplant. This was for a Fuchs patient. And then I'll show you with a slide here coming up that we really don't do full cornea transplants anymore for, for patients that have um, for that Fuchs dystrophy or very rarely uh, you, you do usually a DSEC or a DMEC procedure where you're transplanting the endothelium. But you can see here, this is a tree fine. I think that's the, the appropriate word for that. And you can see the surgeon is marking, but look how the surgeon is just kind of grinding on the eye. And when I see surgery like this, this got me to be a little bit more aggressive, still gentle, but yet a little bit more aggressive when taking out foreign bodies and you know, using an algebra brush. Right now, what he's doing is decompressing the eye. He's really just kind of grinding down on that eye just to kind of make the pressure as low as possible, forcing flew it out through that trabecular meshwork. Now the surgeon is cutting and cutting down through that cornea. Now that the eye is a little bit soft, you don't really want a pressure of 50 in the eye. Not to be doing surgery on that. If it was that high for this, he's checking to see how deep he is now. You can see how soft that eye is because really what you, you don't really want a high pressure uh, so that whenever they do open the eye, you want to keep the lens and the vitreous and everything in the back where it belongs. So that's why they try and soften that eye so much. And this is just a diamond blade knife um, that's going around now. And I believe they're into the anterior chamber here. You can see this is a small graft. Um, in a keratoconic type of situation, the the cone would have to be uh, would have to be grabbed or you know have to be cut out for lack of a better term. And so the graft is a lot larger. So this is not for keratoconus. Um, this again was for a Fuchs patient, which again we would be doing like a a DSEC or a DMEC procedure, decimate stripping of the endothelial keratoplasty where they're just kind of replacing the uh, the endothelium and DSEC has a little bit of stroma and DMEC either has none or very little. You just kind of got decimase membrane in the endothelial cells. So I just kind of wanted to show you uh, a cornea transplant. I thought this was kind of neat to see here. The, I've been in the surgery a couple times uh, to see these and uh, you know, this is pretty, pretty cool. Um, you know, at some point, you know, the, there's a, you know, the wide open now, right? You're right into the anterior chamber and, you know, now you're going to put the graph in there and uh, you'll see here, pull it into place. And I just think it's amazing just to you know, watch these hands and how they can work under the microscope and how they get these sutures in. And it almost looks like a, like a, like a sewing machine, put them in there, but uh, the time they're all said and done. So what you're going to see, you know, this surgeon, this surgeon, and this surgery here, Joe, is they're going to put in a four interrupteds. You're going to see one here, one here, you know, kind of in that 12, you know, six, three, and nine o'clock position. And that's kind of hold that transplant into place uh, so that it doesn't spin. And then they'll put the running sutures in here. So just thought it was kind of neat just to kind of show a, a, a surgical video change it up a little bit tonight from some of the stuff that we've been doing. And uh, you can kind of see what an eye goes through. Kind of fast forwarded, I edited part of it out. There's your interrupted. You can see three of them here. Eventually, I think you'll see the fourth one up here, but you can see it's just kind of holding that cornea into place and the surgeon is just going through and putting in uh, 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 these running sutures. Towards the end here, you'll you'll see here, I think we're getting there. I'm just gonna kind of see if I click here, if it will help out. Right here, I'll pause it. The, the, the sutures are all in place. 
Uh, there's two running sutures. Now, what the surgeon has done here is the room is uh, really dark. You can see it's kind of gotten dim, but they're using this to see if there's any, uh, you know, really bad irregular stigmatism or, or stigmatism that they can adjust the sutures here. So they're using this kind of as a placido disc. And then checking the checking the wound right here for any types of leaks is really what's happening, just kind of going around and seeing if that's all kind of kind of short up there. So, you know, keratoconus, um, we don't want it to get to that point where it needs a corneal transplant. You can see down here, this one would. Um, it's a, uh, you know, progressive cornea disease, focal thinning, you know, caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. I think we're all pretty, pretty good with keratoconus. I think probably, you know, this is going to probably settle somewhere in between, you know, previous estimates was one in you know, uh, 2000, but now we have uh, one in 375. That was from the uh, Netherlands. So, you know, it's probably a little bit more frequent now that we have the technology to diagnose it. You know, the conventional treatment was glasses, RGP, scleral lenses, intrastromal rings, and corneal transplants. And, you know, the importance of early diagnosis is now that we have, you know, cornea cross-linking that's out there. And so, you know, what we're, our job is as optometrists is to you know, identify these, these early form thrust cones or stage one, grade one cones, so that now that we have an FDA approved procedure, we can at least get a consult. And if nothing's done, we can monitor them extremely closely and watch for progression and get them uh, a corneal cross-linking procedure. In that procedure, the epithelium is removed. The cornea is soaked with uh, the B vitamin, uh, riboflavin, this 5-phosphate and 20% dextran. You know, it's called Frotrexa when it's done uh, by Glaucos's uh, procedure. Um, they check for flare to make sure that there's plenty of, uh, of, of this material or this chemical into the eye. And, you know, once the flare is observed and they measure the cornea thickness, then they basically uh, use radiation, as you can see here, and uh, in a, basically suntan the eye for 30 minutes. Now, you heard Joe mention, you know, uh, I folded at the during the introduction, the nice introduction, thanks, Joe, um, that... You know, I've been doing, you know, anti-aging, vitality, and, you know, sun, you know, creates aging. So we probably wouldn't think, you know, this would be a good thing, but this is kind of using maybe something that we consider bad at times in a good way. We're taking this riboflavin and we're hitting it and creating a chemical reaction, which ultraviolet light, basically aging the cornea instantaneously, or if you could say over 30 minutes of time, if that's instantaneous, but you're creating all these cross-linking and for lack of a better term, through all this oxidative stress, which we're always trying to prevent. And uh, now we're using it in a positive way to now stiffen up this cornea and, uh, and uh, hopefully prevent this patient from getting keratoconus. Now, with that being said, I wanted to kind of show you this because I showed you that cornea transplant. And here is a, you know, a patient that had a DSEC procedure. And you can see this is a month out. And this is why we prefer this nowadays. Find a corneal specialist that's doing DSEC, DMEC. And this is a patient that had fuchs, they had boule, they had swelling, and Four to five weeks later, this cornea looks awesome uh, after they got that transplant and just basically transplanting the endothelial cells to the patient. All right, let me just check the chat box real quick. Looks pretty quiet and we'll move on to case four. So case four here is a 28-year-old man. He had LASIK 14 months ago. His right eye is now very blurry. Tried calling for an appointment. The center's closed. You can see here, minus seven in the uh, stigmatism department. He, he has, everything looked good. Trace fibrosis at the edge, no staining. There's some multi-directional striae in this LASIK flap. The, the interface was clean. The fundus was good. But 
I wanted to kind of show you what his topography looked like. And you can see right here, you can see his topography. You can see how thin his cornea is. It's now starting to affect, but it's pretty well centered, right? This is a, uh, uh, this is a keratoectasia uh, from LASIK. Uh, so he came in, was wondering what was going on. The center's closed and ended up seeing them and had to give him, in a sense, the, the bad news that he's had uh, keratoectasia from LASIK. We were able to correct them with an RGP for, for many years. And then it just progressed to a point where maybe a sclera would work, but he ended up getting a, uh, uh, a, a full penetrating keratoplasty in January 2006. Um, we still see this patient. Uh, he ended up like in 2014, 2015. Other eye kind of followed the same suit, a little bit of, you could see whenever I showed you, he had a little bit of astigmatism. It was pretty well uh, seeing eye. He started developing, you know, some uh, uh high astigmatism, again, got to a high route, high amount. And then uh, he's now had bilateral cornea transplants and, uh, uh, and he's wearing RGPs. And this is one of those guys where you just smell the roses. He wasn't looking for attorneys. He wasn't looking for anything. He was just like, well, I guess if anything bad was going to happen with a procedure, you know, I guess, you know, that's my luck. And you know, he, I forget how he said it. Maybe I was being too greedy, trying to get rid of my glasses or contacts. And, and now I ended up with bilateral cornea transplants. Luckily, the, uh, someone was gracious enough to donate their eyes after passing. And now I can see, and he has 2020 vision, but he wears RGP. So just, uh, just a great patient to have with a great you know, outlook, uh, to life when something like that has happened, spent all that money to try and get rid of his glasses and contacts and, bilateral cornea transplants with RGPs. So that's kind of his update. But whole point is I just kind of want to kind of show you what um, what this looks like, you know, posterior, anterior float when it comes to these uh, cornea conditions that are out there. All right, let's see if we can get polling question number three. You know, recurrent corneal erosion is a disease of the tear layer, anterior basement membrane, elastin and collagen in the stroma. Never thought of it this way. So what is recurrent corneal erosion? Tear film, anterior basement membrane, elastin and collagen. Joe, I see you put the handouts in the uh, chat. They're in the chat box. So anyone that's looking for handouts tonight, you, I do six slides per page, and then I also do the full slides. Usually, and we do talks. I usually get the request, especially in the OCT talks. Can I have the full slides? And so I just became accustomed that I just share both. If you guys want the full slides, they're there, and if you want the uh, six per slide, and that's how they'll be in the uh, in the email links also. Well, it looks like everyone's pretty much on top of this one, Joe, if you want to end that one and we'll keep right. moving along. So, yeah, we, you know, we have a few people that, you know, they're outside the uh, anterior basement membrane. I can see 86% of the people are on top of this and, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's talk about it a little bit here. And let's see if I get this to go forward. So this is case five. This is a 43-year-old man. He called your office today. He's got pain in his right eye since this morning. So he woke up with you know this pain. He's 2080 now. So you'll see here quickly how an epithelial defect and a little bit of swelling, right? That cornea that is uh, you know 66%. The power comes from the cornea. Uh, his externals are, are normal. Uh, his his, uh, his uh, review of systems is normal, and you know, here's his uh, here's his slit lamp evaluation. You know your you know your evaluation or your your differential. You know it's corneal abrasion, it's an ulcer, it's a herpetic lesion. And one of the things that you know kind of said he woke up with it this morning. One of the things that we can do, and a lot of times anterior basement membrane dystrophy, like eighty six percent of the people mentioned that taking this tonight. You know, you can look at the other eye and you can see just about in the same area and it doesn't have to be the same area, but you could see just in this patient that they have 
you know, EBMG, and we can cheat by looking at the other eye um, if they're not, you know, eroded in a sense or have an abrasion. So I chatted with this gentleman, you know, 40, 43 year old man, uh, man. This is his, you know, fourth time in the last 24 months. He's been using Muro 128 drops and ointment. So now we got a recurrent corneal erosion secondary to epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. Yeah, I think we all know how to treat a uh, an abrasion. I'm not going to kind of uh, beat up on this slide. It's you know you're going to use probably some steroids, keep help with the pain, some antibiotics. You know, it could be a bandage contact lens. It could be oral over the counters. This might be something for Lortab or uh, uh, some maybe narcotic tramitol or something that's out there. And so your know, real quick review map dot dystrophy. You can see it there. That's what happens in basement membrane dystrophy. But, you know, what do you do once this heals up, right? Like, all right, we, we healed the abrasion. This is his now fifth time, or this is the fourth time in the last 24 months. You know, we have medical treatments here. We could use hypertonics. I would use this a lot. And maybe, Joe, you like to write. Maybe we can get this written up sometime. I never really saw it in literature. I call it a, a nocturnal bandage contact lens. I probably have probably five people in my practice I bring them in about every six months just to make sure they're not getting any problems. Um, and usually after about two years, we try stopping it. So what, what's, what's a nocturnal bandage contact lens? I use a focus night and day. Patient kind of wears it in reverse. I have our contact lens uh, expert in our practice or you know, expert in a sense as our training technician. And she'll train the, the, the person how to put the minus a quarter or plus a quarter focus night and day in we train them they buy the boxes you know they buy two boxes you know a year and uh whatever it is maybe it's four boxes i think she changes them and has them throw it away every two weeks but the the key here is she trains them to put the contact lens in at night before going to bed because where do they tear open it's when do they tear open is you know, when they wake up in the morning and their eyelid is stuck to their epithelium, maybe it's during the REM sleep and all this deep sleep that we're learning about that's out there, but they tear open in the morning. And so we use the, I use the contact lens kind of as a, as a bandage contact lens. And then what they do is they get up, kind of get their day going, take the lenses out or take the lens out if it's a unilateral case, clean it, soak it, and they go on their day. And they kind of use it as a retainer uh, at night. So that's one way. And that's because they don't want to do things like doxycycline or they're not interested in using an amniotic membrane. They're not interested in going into surgical procedures like micropuncture or manual or chemical debridement or even a PTK procedure uh, that can be used. And basically, phototherapeutic keratectomy is nothing more than uh, PRK, just without a treatment or, and sometimes it's can be with a treatment. If you're trying to treat something, it's just therapeutic. And how that came about was when PRK came out and they would scrape the epithelium off. And now nowadays, I think they use like denatured uh, alcohol to kind of soften it up and remove it, kind of push it off to the side. Sometimes they kind of push it back on now in the PRK pr pr procedures, but the point of that was when they go back to do an enhancement, it was always a little harder to get it off that second time. So someone said, hey, maybe we can do this for, you know, those EBMD, those anterior basement membrane disease patients. And, uh, and so that's where PTK came out. So, you know, the question is, when is it time for a surgical procedure? And the answer is when there's failure on medical therapy. And that holds true, right? That holds true for cataracts. It holds true for glaucoma patients. You think you're sending them someone for SLT or maybe a, a TRAB, probably more or less nowadays, a TRAB. In this case here, you know, you might send it to the surgeon to do PTK or one of the chemical or mechanical, whatever your corneal specialist is doing nowadays to treat this. And, you know, you might see the corneal specialist say, well, let's try doxycycline or let's try an amniotic membrane. And you get frustrated because, you know, hey, it's going to need a surgical procedure. 
And remember, surgeons are trained to do surgery once all the medical options have been weighed out, right, or have been uh, have been given. So, you know, a newer surgeon might come out and, you know, you know that someone is, you know, minus, you know, two in one eye and minus six in the other, and they had a refractive shift. Maybe they were minus six and they got a plus, or maybe they were minus two, minus two, now they're minus six. And you know, it's not going to work. So you say, well, go get your cataract out. And the surgeon says, well, you know, let's try the glasses first so that they have failure so that they can document and, you know, in case something goes wrong. So we see it sometimes with glaucoma, you know, oh, let's try the fifth medication on this patient. Again, because they want to make sure things are medically uh, exhausted before moving on to surgery. So sometimes you might see surgeons doing doxycycline or minocycline to kind of before they end up going on to a surgical procedure for, for this EBMD or this recurrent corneal erosion. So I've been pretty successful by using a cryopreserved amniotic membrane in the practice. And I'm gonna jinx myself one of these times. Since I've kind of been doing this procedure and using it on recurrent corneal erosion, I think I'm like 22 for 22. Patients, they, they tear open. And this kind of the scenario is, um, you know, they usually end up on my schedule or I see them in the office after the abrasion is healed. And I'll just say to the patient, look, the next time you tear open, I don't want to go in and kind of debride you now or debride you, debride you, uh, to be able to, to do this at this point. The next time you tear open, just come on in and, uh, you know, that day, and then we'll put this membrane on and I have them do some reading up on it and so on and so forth. Now, this is kind of neat because I start to speak both languages now. Like I said, I've been taking some anti-aging courses and vitality courses. Amniotic membrane, this is the guys that are doing it out there. You're, you're an integrative optometrist because there's nothing allopathic about an amniotic membrane, right? This is from a baby. This is natural. You know, you can call this alternative if you want type of way to treat things. This isn't taking something like in pharmacology. This is something that's natural and using it. So amniotic membranes, if you're doing it, you're probably didn't know you were doing it, but you're doing integrative or complementary medicine out there because this is naturopathic way of, you know, healing the, 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 uh, the condition. So an amniotic membrane is from the placenta. Um, this is from plan C sections. These Companies aren't hanging out at the hospital, paying people to say, hey, it looks like you're going in today having a baby. Mind if we snag that placenta when you're all said and done? These are planned, planned C-sections that are out there. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of paperwork and blood work that goes into, uh, to, to, in a sense, harvesting the, the, the placenta and the amniotic membrane. Um, I'm a big fan of the cryopreserved. Be, I've used uh, the dehydrated and you lose a few things in a dehydrated process. I would say for something like this, I would probably use cryopreserved. There are some places for dehydrated out there, but I'm a more of a cryopreserved and kind of a little bit more advanced procedure, like an, an epi, epi, uh, 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 epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. Um, so they have a, this, this proprietary way of harvesting this and cryopreserving it that we don't have to really get into the details. When it comes to amniotic membranes, what's really cool is they, you know, they go against uh, anti, uh, they're, they're anti-inflammatory, they're anti-scarring, they're anti-angiogenic, they stop blood vessel growth, they promote stem cell expansion, suppress pain, and it helps expedite recovery uh, that's out there. So again, the Procare uses that cryotech uh, technology. Um, again, this is not to say that I just do cryopreserves and everything. I, I do have a few limited places where I do de uh, the dehydrated. It's just in this case, I think you need more of the biologics that are preserved in that cryo uh, preserve process to be treating uh, an EBMD. So if you're going to be doing trying this on yourself and trying to get a track record going, then I would recommend maybe going with uh, one of the single membranes here. You know, what happens is you'll debride them and sometimes it goes limbus to limbus and then you put the, the, uh, the Procara on. Now it's not a real hot eye. So 
you want to at least have it on there for about five days before it uh, kind of melts away. That's out there. PTK, uh, it could be used for corneal opacities, uh, scarring, granular dystrophy, can be used for Salzman nodules. Usually they remove the Salzman nodule, kind of surgically polish it, kind of smooth that cornea out if they're using that eczema laser. Um, and then you can put you know, maybe a Procare on there and to kind of help that cornea heal. And then you can use it for surface breakdown as we're talking about here with EBMD. Remove the epithelium, you, you debris, and you polish with the eczema laser. These are some, some fun videos that I got um, from a surgeon that I work with that uh, you know, I was beating, you know, surgeon said, Greg, I know you're beating yourself up on this, on this one patient. So um, basically the surgeon sent me a couple videos here. So this is PRK. Let me just show you PRK here. And apologize for the static. I don't think there's any talking, but I we want to, towards the end here, make sure that we hear uh, one of my patients talking. So that's kind of a little static in the background. But this is PRK. Watch as the surgeon, look at the cornea indenting, and they're scraping away here. And you can see, you know, just a, in a sense, and it's a pretty big abrasion, but there's a lot of pressure. You can see the cornea indenting going back and forth. I just kind of want to show you kind of the in a sense, I'll use the word aggressiveness here. Um, and you can see that they're just scraping, scraping, scraping. And after all that, that's where we ended up. Now, let me show you a patient that has, that's going for PTK before I started using amniotic membranes. Pretty old video, but this patient I'm sending for PTK because we did the doxycycline. We were using the nocturnal bandage contact lenses. We were doing contact lenses during the day, so on and so forth. You can see even the day of the PTK, the patient has an abrasion. You can see the eyes red and inflamed, just irritated from this condition. But I want to show you what happens when we remove the epithelium here. Watch, again, I've shown you before how aggressive, right? Surgeon was scraping away. Watch this here. Watch how gentle this is. Just this is EBMD at its best, at its worst. Imagine that eyelid sticking to that epithelium at night while the patient is sleeping. And you can see there why that epithelium during that EBMD condition, just really that epithelium has no chance to survive. And that's why I was showing that kind of, I use that word aggressive, kind of look how gentle this is. And, and I can tell you the reason why I point, I love showing this video. I can remember one of the first times I was going to do an EBMD patient. And they came in, they had probably a four millimeter, five millimeter abrasion. It was a little bit of epithelium air. So numbed the eye up and said, you know, let me just kind of clean up this loose flap before putting on the, uh, cryopreserved amniotic membrane. And literally this is what happened just by me using a Wexal sponge. I did just, just basically trying to clean up that edge or just a little bit of epithelium just ended up just tearing, you know, removing the, the epithelium kind of like this, just limbus to limbus, which then taught me the, the power of the, of the amniotic membrane and how much pain suppression. Cause I remember like, okay, a little abrasion creates, you know, a lot of pain. Jesus, like the whole cornea is removed, you know, 11 millimeters by 11 millimeters. So I said to the patient, I said, Hey, look, why don't we just check you tomorrow and make sure this thing is going. Okay. I really wanted to see how they were doing overnight. Told them to take some Tylenol or ibuprofen. I think the patient might've taken, you know, four ibuprofen, two and two over the course came back in and I was like, oh, how you doing? And uh, I kind of asked my technician, hey, how's she doing? You know, so on and so forth. She's doing great. So I walked in and took a look and everything was fine. I said, okay. And that's where I learned about the power of the pain suppression with, uh, with these amniotic membranes. So I just kind of wanted to show you this case here of how damaged that epithelium is or that basement membrane is. So the post-op for P PTK, Pretty much the same for bandage contact lens. Pick a, you know, pick a, uh, 
a, an antibiotic. You can see a pretty old case here, still talking about Vigamox and Predforte and a BCL, vitamin C, non-preserved tears and sunlight, pretty much what we do for our uh, PRK patients. Here's a before. Um, I usually like when I do this live is ask the audience what this condition is. I realize it's, you know, it's a 2D picture. Uh, it's not 3D, but this is granular dystrophy. It's one of them str stromal dystrophies. This is one of the cases I was able to send for a PTK. And you can see it's usually pretty anterior. So they were able to kind of lasered it out of the way and get some vision back for that patient. This was a Salzman nodule patient. You can see the irregular stigmatism here. What I did on the patient is with the uh, topographer, uh, has a placido disc. I turned it on and kind of got my cell phone and was able to get in there with a placido disc. And you can see here the irregular stigmatism. But we can see that after the surgery, we were able to smooth that all out for the patient and make it look really nice and get rid of that irregular stigmatism, creating, in a sense, maybe that ghosting vision or decrease from that cornea that is 66% of the power. All right. Where are we with time here? We're doing well. Okay, so let's do case six here. Case six is an 84-year-old woman. Right eye is red and painful. It started about 10 days ago. Let's take a look at the photos. Not much discussion will go on, but you can see here we have something that's really red, painful, infected, some cellulitis, no fever. So we could say preceptal cellulitis. And what we have here is a patient with a dacryocystitis. So we put the patient on some oral antibiotics, pick your favorite one, check for allergies, and uh, hopefully this we can get this to clear up. So I did some topicals on this patient. Uh, we did some orals. You could see that the cellulitis, the nodule started to go down, but this was a pretty big rupture here. So I kind of figured this patient would probably need some type of uh, DCR procedure, dacryocystorhinostomy procedure. So we were able to continue the topicals. We got that kind of that acute infection calmed down. We got some reversal here. So we got them off to the oculoplastics doc to, to get a DCR uh, consult. So I just kind of want to just kind of talk about this cartoon's okay to kind of show what happens in a DCR. But what happens in a DCR is, you know, you have your, you know, your upper, lower, you know, puncta, you have your cannula, your common cannuliculus, you have your nasal lacrimal sac, you got your nasal lacrimal duct. And what they're showing here is the blockage. And that's usually what happens is the, you know, they'll find where the blockage is, maybe do some probing. And then uh, they'll find out where the blockage is and they'll cut the tube right about, you know, the nasal lacrimal duct right above where the blockage is. Well, now you got to reconnect it. So what they do is they kind of break through that lacrimal fossa bone. It's up against the nose there, kind of chisel away, pop a hole through there. And then they grab the nasal mucosa or the, yeah, the nasal mucosa. And they kind of sew that all together. But because you just created all the inflammation and the body likes to heal, that's why they run that silicone tube up. They start with one end, go through the upper puncta, through the sac, down through the duct and into the nose. And then it kind of hangs out the nose. Same thing with the lower, go through kind of that same track down through the nose, tie a knot, tie a knot, cut off the excess, kind of put everything back together. That's in an external DCR. They can do these endoscopically too, a little bit higher success rate with an external, but still a high success rate with the endoscopic. And so they put everything back together, you know, put the sutures in. That's what they did for this young lady, my patient. And then they leave those tubes in there, six, nine, 12 months, so that as the body heals and, and, and with all that inflammation that was just created, those tubes are in place. And then after six, nine, 12 months, after the inflammation is all calmed down, you could take the tubes out and everything is stays open. So it's just kind of a really neat way to use silicone tubes. And the patient really doesn't have epiphora because that tube acts as, in a sense, like a candle wick and pulls the tears down and into the nose. So it's not really 
blocking it either. It's kind of acts as a candle wick and again, eliminating the epiphora or maybe minimizing uh, the, the epiphora. So you can see, this is my patient. Uh, she looks great. She went through the external approach. And sometimes, like I said, it's a little bit higher success rate. And the reason why they don't want to is, you know, because it creates a, a scar, but you can see, she's like, listen, I got a bunch of wrinkles here. Um, I really don't care. And I want to have a higher success rate. You can see here's her tube in place. You know, she, this is after the surgery and these surgeons are great. These oculoplastics guys. I mean, you can't even hardly tell you know, where the incision is. So that's what they did for her. And they kind of put her all back together after having that really bad, you know, dacryocystitis. There's what she looked like before. So she looks great um, afterwards. Here's me taking out a tube. Oh, it says it cannot find the media. Let's see if it doesn't play, then it's okay. And you can just imagine I'm grabbing the, uh, the, 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 uh, the tube here, I pull it out and I cut the loop and there's a knot. And sometimes if the knot is big, you can have them blow their nose and they can pull the tube out. Um, the surgeon I use does a really small knot. So I'm just able to kind of pull that out, uh, uh, out of there for, for the patient. All right. Case number seven. So let's do polling question number two. Is this a Branch retinal vein occlusion, just yes or no. Branch retinal vein occlusion. Yes or no. Nothing's in the chat box. Joe, any nope. comments to this point? Nope, nope. I think you're 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 cruising right along. People, you know, people need to realize that. Nasal lacrimal system is very delicate, and you really need to have people who are, are skilled uh, when, when they're probing, probing around down there or doing the DCR. It, it, it's a fairly significant procedure. Yeah. Well, we got a good, good response already, Greg, on this one. Yeah, go ahead and end it. You can see here we got about a third saying yes. We got uh, uh, sixty-six percent or sixty-seven percent saying no. So about a third and two thirds. You know, I felt this was a was a was a branch retinal vein occlusion when I first saw it. Um, when you get through the case here, you'll see what what has happened. So this was a thirty-five-year-old man that came in. He wanted another opinion for the hemorrhage on his right eye, and it happened three days ago. He claims vomiting after eating a chicken Caesar salad. He still feels a little bit nauseated. He saw the ophthalmologist three days ago. He told he had a bruise on his eye and uh, it should just go away in about, uh, whoop, what did I do? It said it should go away in about uh, one to two weeks. Um, you know, the bruise should go away. So he, he just, he wanted another opinion. So here's his bruise on his eye. And so I agree, it's a subconscious heme. And so uh, he comes in for that second opinion and I'm looking at his you know, visual acuity here. He's got a history of amblyopia, it's 2100. And his current prescription is plus 550 and plus 450. So, you know, what's the concern here? You know, he's coming in because of his right eye. And uh, maybe, you know, maybe I pick up on this. You know, I have worked with students and externs. They they do some of the work up in the practice. I have an extern now, but I was did a residency and I quickly looked at this and and now he was focused on his right eye and his history is about his right eye. And I said to him, I said, hey, hey boss, what's going on with your left eye here? And uh, he said, um, I don't, you know, I don't know, doc, um, but uh, did you see my right eye? Do you see how red and bloody it is and so on and so forth? And we kind of had this back and forth. Yeah, 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 I see that. But tell me a little bit about your left eye. And I said, okay, let me address your right eye. And then can you tell me a little bit more about your left eye? And he said, yeah, I noticed that my left eye was blurry about two weeks ago, but I'm not really mentioning it because, hey, did you see my right eye and how the blood is? So he was really focused on the blood. So we chatted and he's had headaches for two weeks. And if he changes his posture, um, the headache will increase or de decrease. So that was something that I didn't like. Uh, so, uh, you know, review of systems, 35-year-old was unremarkable. 
So I said, let's dilate them up and, you know, let's see what's going on here. Now, I did take a little bit of quick look with a 90 on dilating. That's what uh, decided to, once he was dilated, this is what he looked like. So, you know, during the uh, live meetings, I usually like to ask, you know, is this normal or abnormal? And I think we all know it's pretty abnormal. And I said, all right, um, I'm going to get some pictures of you here because I really was like, what the heck? A bilateral CRVO, um, but, but, yeah, bilateral uh, central retinal vein occlusion. So I'm like, start, I need like some time to kind of think a little bit, kind of scratch my head, maybe grab a book. Um, so took, said to my photographer, I said, listen, you're going to see blood everywhere. Like you got to have like poker face and you see anything you can say, yeah, but let the doc, yeah, let the doc go over it. So the nice thing was, you know, we have these digital images and you can open them up in the viewing area. And it wasn't until I opened them up outside the exam room that I'm like, oh, I can see what's happening here. And it was really more or less kind of looking at both eyes here because I looked at this eye and I said, okay, we have a boat shaped hemorrhage. We got a pre retinal hemorrhage. I've got blood that's under the neurosensory retina. Okay, that's two different levels. But then if you can appreciate, and if you can still see it over here, it's, it's elevated, but this is a little bit better eye to see it in. <clears throat> and this is pre retinal blood here. This is uh, in front of the you know, behind the vitreous in front of the retina. This is kind of a small boat shaped hemorrhage here. This is, if you look right here, this is elevated. You can see the elevation that's happening here. And then we have that under the neurosensory in front of the RPE blood. Now, coronal neovascular membranes or neovascularization elsewhere of the disc usually creates two layers. Coronal neovascular membrane under the RPE, above the RPE, doesn't really break through the neurosensory retina and create a vitreous hemorrhage or preretinal. So most neovascularization of the eye, it's usually two levels, whether it's neovascularization elsewhere, neovascularization of the disc, you know, whether it's from a CRAO, CRVO, usually CRAOs don't create neo, can from time to time, but it's usually your vein occlusion. They're all kind of two. I'm like, oh, two, three layers. And I remember... You know, there was something that they taught us like in school about that. And uh, when I racked my brain and started thinking about it, it was the Tursen syndrome. This is what this was. This was a Tursen syndrome. And, you know, Tursen syndrome was originally defined by the occurrence of vitreous hemorrhage in the association of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. But now it really, the syndrome encompasses really any intraocular hemorrhage associated with intracranial hemorrhage with elevated intracranial pressures. So let me explain what's happening here is this patient is bleeding inside their head. And what's happening is the blood is finding its way to come down the optic nerve head sheets. And then if you remember like how the optic nerve plugs into the retina, there's that loose association. So as that blood comes down, it's kind of taking a detour, right? It's going under the RPE. It's going under the neurosensory retina and it's going right in front of the neurosensory retina, but behind the vitreous because he's 35 years old. He's got a pretty good vitreous intact. So as that blood comes down and it's kind of, working its way into the eye. Let me go back so you can see those pictures now. You can see that it's using the entry point, especially in this eye, you can see it's using the optic nerve head and it's just kind of bleeding. You can see the blood that's under here, blood's in front, blood is a, kind of at all three levels uh, for this patient. So, you know, luckily I had Yanoff's book uh, that was there. I was able to look up Tursen syndrome and uh, we were able to get this person right over to the uh, to the emergency room. And I copied a few pages. I think it was three or four pages of the book. Kind of nowadays, what I would do would probably you know PDF them and send them over. But we had a fax at that point and faxed them over and called and said, "Look, you need to go to the ER. You got a hemorrhage in your head. That's why you're not feeling. Look at this blood." And he agreed. He needs to be over there. So on and so forth. 
So, you know, as, as Joe and I always talk with some of these neuro cases, you know, just don't send them over there. Give them some help, right? Pupils are dilated. I don't want them to think that the pupils are blown, uh, that type of thing. Um, explain that I did dilate the patient, that the pupils were normal. What's going on with the postural changes? When they change their posture, their, um, you know, the headaches increase or get better. And you know, they have a Tursen syndrome, so I sent over the pages. And the neurologist was very pleased and very happy that we did that, or I did that, and, the, and our office did it. And the patient ended up uh, getting confirmed with an MRI, uh, then later was diagnosed with hairy cell leukemia and cryptococcal meningitis. And so I didn't know this until having the case that hairy cell leukemia is very treatable. Um, they felt that the cryptococcal meningitis came from the patient having this type of leukemia, and uh, this patient was um, from Atlanta and they were actually up helping, uh, he was helping his mom. She had a colon resection. So she was going through the colon resection. He was up kind of taking her to the doctor visits and doing the, you know, the son mom thing. And so he was able to get back to Atlanta, have his treatment for his hairy cell leukemia. And it's neat. It's, uh, I think it's probably, I think 17, maybe 16, doesn't matter. Uh, years now, because every year I uh, keep the stack of Christmas cards that he sends me. Uh, so he survived and I don't have any follow-up photos, but I do know that his left eye went back to 2025 vision. So he was able to get that vision back in his, in his, in his, in his left eye. So that's a, the, the, there's a question that came through. I'm sorry, Greg. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Did you call or consider calling EMS to transport this patient? Yeah. Um, that was a thought, but uh, he was there with a family member. And, you know, since he wasn't driving, um, uh, we did not use that. Uh, sometimes we have to use that from that very first case that we talked about, those CRAOs, when a patient comes in and they've driven in by themselves and, and we need to get them over to the hospital and we don't want them to be having strokes and heart attacks <clears throat> at that time. Um, but, uh, this person was with someone and they promised to go over and, and I could tell by the look on his face when he saw his eyes, the way they looked that he was going over there. But Joe, what are your thoughts? Uh, should I have called the EMS? No, in a situation like that, he was, you know, he had, he had been bleeding. He was, he had not, he didn't have any altered consciousness. He, he could make informed decisions and drive. It's the person with the unruptured aneurysm, because if that pops, they can, you know, they, they can lose consciousness. You know, talking about Tursen syndrome, a couple, a couple of clinical pearls. If you have those multi-layer, first off, things that can cause multi-layer hemorrhages. One is, uh, Tursen syndrome. The other is retinal arterial macro aneurysm, and you know they're they're usually fairly straightforward to uh, to differentiate. But a person who's had recent head trauma and that has multi-layer hemorrhages, particularly those that may be juxtapapillary, they probably have an intracranial bleed. Now, what about that person who didn't have head trauma, but they have a history of headache? Well, they've ruptured an aneurysm. So that's where it comes from. Perfect. Thank you. And thanks, Melissa, for the uh, for the question. All right. Let me go through this case pretty quickly. Um, this is an eight-year-old girl. You know, I consider anyone in my practice pediatric if they're not in a bifocal. That's kind of, I'm at the geriatric end seeing patients all day long. So when I see an eight-year-old girl, I'm like, what's going on here? But mom noticed some pimples on the lid started two days ago. Uh, started getting more pimples of the eyelid, globe wasn't affected. And so we're looking in this area right here. And uh, you can see a little bit closer up right here what's going on. And this is nothing more than, uh, and I've seen this enough now, wasn't sure what it was earlier in my career. This is in a sense like a herpes simplex uh, dermatitis is, or blepharitis in this case, this is herpes simplex. Um, this was a really quick call to the pediatrician. I, they said, what would you use an adult? I said, 800 milligrams, acyclovir, uh, or you could do Valtrex. 
pediatrician said, let's do a cyclovir, do 400 milligrams five times a day, cut it in half. It's a very safe medication. And we were able to treat this. There's really no other follow-up because the mom said, hey, I'm not bringing a my patient back in. This was a, another optometrist in the area that saw the patient. If, you know, $25 copay. Trust me, everything's all cleared up. We'll finish the, uh, you know, we'll finish the acyclovir. So really not much more of a follow-up on, on that. Here's where we're going to use the chat box. So, um, well, I guess I lost my animation. We don't have to use the chat box since I lost my animation on this. So this was a 58-year-old uh, woman uh, visual acuity was uh, 2200 and 2400. Long standing history of macular degeneration. So the question is, was going to use for the chat box, you know, what's suspicious here? You know, how can a patient 58 years old uh, have, um, in a sense, macular degeneration and 2200 and 2400 vision? She has a history of cataract surgery. She's minus one in both eyes. And basically, here are the retinas. And so I agree that the maculas are degenerated, but it's not age-related macular degeneration. That's what she was told, that she had age-related macular degeneration. So when we chatted with her, you know, she... You know, we just had to clarify that, look, it's, it's, it's some words here, but I don't want you to think that you have macular degeneration based upon, you know, there's genetics to that. And maybe you'll be telling your children this. I just want you to be aware that this is not macular degeneration. Her axial length was almost 30 uh, millimeters. The average axial length is about 23 and a half, 24, 23, somewhere in that range. So you can see that she's about six millimeters long. And before her cataract surgery, she was minus 18. So this gets us now to, she. this is nothing more than, you could see the disc, it's tilted. You could see this kind of, kind of case two, the reverse, you know, this is posterior keratoconus, if you want to call it that way, or think of it, this is keratoconus of the back of the eye. This is, uh, this is pathological myopia or degenerative myopia. So this is pathological myopia. You can tell by the axial length. You can tell by the high prescription. Now we can use the chat box in this one here. And I want you guys to respond and make this interactive. You know, at what diopter value do you tell your patients, you know, that they have degenerative myopia? Like, where's your cutoff point? Is it like a minus 10? Is it a minus 12? You know, what, what is it out there? What do you think? Seeing a lot of minus 10s roll in, anything greater than eight. I see a little comment with retinal changes. We got someone going as high as 15, 16. We had a 16, 16. Give me 16. Get a little, 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 little. Can do a 16. Give six, 12, 16. All right. It's like an auction. It's like an auction out there. Got 12. And it's and it's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> and I agree with the with the audience here. When you start getting the minus 10, you got to scratch your head a little bit but we don't make the diagnosis of pathological myopia. I like the one comment there, it said with retinal changes. We really don't make the diagnosis you know, with the phoropter. It was kind of a loaded question, but I'm with you too. Like, Do I think about pathological myopia when it's minus four? Nah, probably not. When I get the minus 10, I see a lot of minus 10s and there was 12s and 16s and so on and so forth. Sure, you want to make sure you're taking a look at that retina. Degenerative myopia, pathological myopia, again, think of it as keratoconus of the back of the eye. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it, there's an elongation, it's progressive, just kind of sounds like uh, keratoconus. Um, there is an elastin and collagen issue. And then what happens is you get that posterior staphyloma. That's that, you know, you know, no PCO, these so it's the hallmark sign. Maybe that's a universal word that they use at all the schools, but the hallmark sign of degenerative myopia is that posterior staphyloma, which is really more in the macular region, is where you're going to kind of hear me kind of start stressing out and changing the focus here. 
Now, in the general myopia, you get lacquer cracks, posterior staphyloma. You can get a fuke spot. You get a little hemorrhage, RPE atrophy, scleral crescents. But these here, that vessel straightening, you get that. You can get that in an axial myope. You can get the, you know, disc tilting and peripheral retinal changes in axial myopes or refractive. It's more axial. I need to change that. Um, but these posterior staphyloma is more reserved for posterior, you know, I'm saying that as a loose term, you know, uh, posterior keratoconus of the back of the eye. These are the syndromes, I'm not going to read them to you, that have been associated with degenerative myopia. And in this case, you know, there really wasn't more that I could do for this patient uh, that has degenerative myopia. She's had cataract surgery. She's had a lot of the myopia corrected with the implants. Just give her the best corrected acuity, educate her on trauma, um, eye hazards, monitor for that neovascularization that can occur because of the rupture to the Brooks membrane and the RPE. Um, and, you know, watch those peripheral changes and follow up yearly. So I'd like to ask this question and we can use the chat box is you have two patients come to your office. One is an eight diopter axial myope. The other one is a minus 14. Which one is higher for a, oh, we don't have to use a chat box. I think there might be a, uh, an answer, Joe. They can use the clicking away. I think because I have pulled five there. Yeah, so, know. yep, thank you. Which one is at higher risk for retinal attachment? The axial myope at minus eight. Is it the minus 14 patient degenerative myope? <laughs> Which one's at higher risk? <laughs> That's a good one. Anything greater than my trial lens uh, contact limit. There you go. All right. I think we got a good sampling here. So I'm going to end the poll. Here's a quick question, Greg. Posterior staphyloma versus scleral ectasia, same or different? Uh, I would say that they're probably the same as long as it is contained to, I guess, the posterior pole. Scleral ectasia, I could probably think that that could happen in some of the rheumatological conditions that are out there. Um, so, you know, you have your patients that have an autoimmune, you know, the whole autoimmune spectrum. Um, you could get scleral ectasia from those, but if it's just confined to the posterior pole, it's probably a form of, uh, of uh, sc scleral ectasia. Agreed. All right. So here we go. We have a patient with a high scleral risk. Which one's at higher risk? We have 71 minus eight and we have, uh, um, we had 30% with degenerative myope. Now, you know, I don't want to get into a big argument here. They're both at risk for a retinal detachment. I get it, but I agree with the majority here that the higher risk is the minus eight. And I have these really fancy drawings here that I made one night. And you can see here that this is you know, kind of the, the eye. And what I'm trying to show you is the aura serrata all the way back to the optic nerve. And in a Oh, I thought I cleaned this up. Then an axial myo, uh, you could see here that the stretching is all the way from the aura serrata to the yeah. optic nerve. So you start getting some more peripheral retina concerns. And when you have a degenerative myo, what I'm trying to show you here is that, you know, this kind of the same curvature is happening here. The disease is in the macula. So I kind of think of degenerative myopia as more of a posterior because how this comes up is about once a year, I'll have someone comes into the practice and they literally, like one lady started crying one time. I closed the door, walked in and said, hey, I'm Greg. We're doing your eye exam today. And let me just see what the, the staff has done here. Let me get caught up on you. How you doing today? And she started crying. And I'm like, geez, oh man, I just met you. I didn't even give you any news yet. And you're crying. She's like, 
I just want to get real quick to the chase. You know, I was, you know, I'm a minus, you didn't really say this, I'm a minus 12. And they told me I had degenerative myopia and I went home, got on Google, read all about it. And, you know, I'm going to get up with macular changes. I can like, you know, how long do I have? And I'm like, all right, well, let's do your exam here. And she just turned out to be an axial myope. She, this minus 12, you know, retinas look great, you know, so I had to kind of undo that. And that's why I wanted to chat about this and not really using the phoropter that's out there. But I agree with the audience that was here tonight that anything above a 10, you know, we got to take a good look there make sure that there isn't a degenerative or pathological myopia situation going on where a staphyloma is creating that stretching that we saw in that lady, so much stretching that the patient ends up with, you know, vision loss from that. So degenerative myopia, I think of it more as a macular disease and the uh, axial myope, more of a peripheral stretching, which puts them at a little bit higher risk of retinal detachment. So if the axial myope, peripheral retinal change concerns, the degenerative myope is more of a posterior staphyloma. And that's why in these axial myopes, you can see, you know, you get a paving stone where you just get a little mini strokes to that choriocapillaris and you get the RPE that drops out and you can see it's a window defect right into the choriocapillaris. You can see a nice vortex vein there. And then little mini strokes to the neurosensory retina create lattice and lattice with holes. So between these two here, this is the little bit higher risk for the retinal attachment because it's a neurosensory retinal problem. And that's why paving stone is really not a is really not an issue. So lattice degeneration is, and then if it's within the vitreous base, that really puts it at a higher risk uh, for detachment. All right. So getting close to be wrapping up here. Here's case 10. What I'll wrap up with here, because we're getting close to that, I think we started at uh, about nine minutes after, so about six minutes here to make sure we're COPE compliant. So 88-year-old man, I see faces of friends that I have not seen for years, wheels of cars that at times, I see wheels of cars and at times pine trees. He's got counting fingers. He's Plano, minus one. And uh, does this patient need a psych consult? You know, they're seeing people there. Uh, let me launch that poll. I'll get it for you, Greg. You got it? Yep. Does this patient need a psych consult? Seeing pine trees and wheels of cars and so on and so forth. Maybe friends he hasn't seen in a while. You know, interesting, uh, just kind of a, a, a bit of a side note, you know, when we start talking about psychology, psych uh, consult, one, one thing we have to be very careful of is using the terms hysterical blindness, psychological vision loss, or particularly malingering. You know, malingering implies, uh, implies gain, they're trying to see gain. I don't think that we are necessarily all qualified to assess that psychological vision loss again we're not psychologists or psychiatrists so anything that we as eye doctors optometrists ophthalmologists or neuro ophthalmologists can really say you know somebody has organic vision loss or non-organic vision loss but we always like to stay away from uh, malingering because we i don't think we're really qualified to assess that uh, it's like psychological vision loss again we're not psychologists or psychiatrists so always try to stick to the facts and say patient has organic vision loss or non-organic vision loss that's and that's just to kill kill or fill, fill the uh, the silence while they're doing the poll yeah that was a great wow that's a great silence silence filler joe that was a great uh, great pearl clinical pearl that's what we try to bring to the audience so um you saw the results there that uh you know, 23% said yes, majority said no at 77. In the meantime, I want to point out that thanks, Joe. Joe Shevlin is a great uh, resource of information. He put in there a link for the risk calculator for RD. Looks like there's a link in there. So before we sign off, you might want to grab that link. Thanks for putting that in there, Joe, uh, Pennsylvania guy up in the Northeast there. 
Um, so this person is, is you hear, you know, A and O times three, what does that mean? Alert and oriented. This person, I traveled so much. I didn't know, you know, what day it was and, you know, maybe the date. Luckily, it's in the charts all the time. But this person know who who he was and who was with them, person, place and time, all that fun stuff. So, you know, we didn't really have to, like, start thinking about making that referral that Joe was talking to about. But if you look right here, you can see this patient just has a really bad geographic atrophy. And you can see the geographic atrophy that's occurring here. And so, you know, Deborah has put in the uh, chat box, Charles Benet syndrome, and that's exactly what's happening. We deal with hallucinations quite a bit. I probably on a daily basis or uh, at least once a week, I'll say that much. We get people that come in with visual hallucination, which is more of an irritative, which is brief, you know, that, that, that uh, visual aura that comes from a migraine or an acephalic migraine where they don't get the headache. They get the visual aura, which is at the, it's a, it's a, it's the base of the skull. It's an occipital lobe issue it has nothing to do with the eyes. We see those, but what we see here with uh, the, with uh, Charles Bonnet, it's what we call a release hallucination. And it's basically due to sensory deprivation. So when our eyes, because of this geographic atrophy here, cannot give the patient uh, uh, the, the, the sensory reward, if you want to say, that they need, then the temporal lobe that has images just releases it. Says, hey, you know, your eyes don't want to give you what you need. Let me help you out here. Let me throw you a picture of something. And that's called a release hallucination that comes from that temporal lobe. Um, so that's reassurance that we want to give the patient. Now, another clinical pearl that I want to give out is the next time you have someone that comes in with 2100 vision in their best eye, best eye, 2100 vision, just say, you know, you know, make it, I like to you know, have fun with the patients. We joke around, so on, lighten the mood, so on and so forth. A lot of times I'm dealing with taking drops and losing vision and macular degeneration and blah, blah, blah. So try and keep it light. But this is one where I'm like, okay, you know, you know, I, you know, I, here's a question I have. I want to be really serious about that. I'm not joking around. I see that with your best eye, you can barely see the big E out there. Are you seeing things, images, cars, people don't think that that's craziness. And, you know, probably like eight times out of 10, they'll go, Oh my gosh, doc. How, how did you know? So, you know, I think we've all had Charles Benet patients and they come in and they're usually with their sons and daughters and they're saying, go ahead, mom, tell them what's going on. So on and so forth. My best clinical pearl I can give you from this case is mine for it, because I can't tell you how many patients have come in thinking like, oh my gosh, am I going crazy? What's going on? So on and so forth. And then I think what they're doing is they're coming in, just get their eyes checked and seeing if maybe the doc sees something. So what I've learned to do is that they got that 2100 vision or worse to say, okay, Mary or Bob or whatever the patient's name is. Can This sounds weird, but based on your eye exam and just my experience that I have, are you seeing people? Are you, you know, you know, seeing images and it's really, really rewarding for them. I want to give you one of my best Charles Benet videos. I got probably about five or six. It's probably my best one right here. I want you to listen to this. And I want you to listen to how she explains. The first thing is it's, it's, they never talk. If it's talking, then we got an issue going on here. So these images will never talk, but I want you to hear how many times she said she's scared. So listen to this video. All right, Lois, can you tell me what you're seeing? Go ahead and tell me again. Uh, on many instances, when I'm reading in a recliner, I'll feel a presence, and I look. It's always on the right, and I look over like this, sort of like, "What the heck's that?" And there'll be people standing there, maybe four people that I don't know. Once or twice, I did know the people, but mostly I don't know them. <laughs> and they just stand there, and they just look at me. No expressions. They don't smile. They don't laugh. Neither do I, because I'm sort of scared. To make it scary. Let me ask, you said that you've noticed people that you, you that you don't recognize, but the people that you do recognize, who, who were they that you recognized? Like my daughter when she was 18, she's 52 now. Okay. 
and uh, my other baby daughter, she was eight then. And when I look over on my corner of my bed, she'll be sitting there like an Indian with her arms folded. And just, they just look at me. It's not exactly a, a hateful snare or stare, but it's... Um, but they're there. They're there and they're looking at me and it makes me mad. Do they, do they go away at times? They're not there they all the time, away, are they? They fade away, yeah. They fade away. Now, my dad usually shows up in the dining room at the dining room table. And he usually shows up when I'm carrying a tray of meat or chicken and dumplings into the dining room. Mm -hmm. And he's in his mining clothes. And he has his mining cap and the lights on. Uh -huh. And he twists his head around and the light flicks all over the room. And there I'm standing with the chicken and dumplings. I'm scared. I don't know whether to put it down and run. Right. Take it back to the kitchen. Okay. <laughs> or what to do. Let me ask you one more. Um, do you mention about your granddaughter? Did you Do you see your granddaughter? Yes, she's 18 now, but I see her when she's a little girl. How old? About? Well, I'd say about seven or eight. It's your granddaughter that you remember when she was seven or eight. For sure, it's your granddaughter, but it's now she's her 18, because right? because I recognize the dresses that my older daughter made for her. Gotcha. And she'll be in one of those outfits, and she just stands there. And now this one, she'll twitch herself, flick her little butt around, you know, like she's trying to show me her dress. Right. But they never speak. Okay. All right. Ugh. Saw a couple times there where she mentioned that, uh, you know, she was scared. And that's why I like to mind for these patients because they, uh, they do get relief once you tell them it's totally normal. So just listen to this is really short here. You know who the president is right now, right? Yeah, Obama. Do you know what year it is? Uh, 2016. Do you know what month it is? It's October. You got it, kid. Don't I come here October and April? You do. So... <laughs> That was very good. Thank you. So, you know, she's, you know, she's, uh, you know, she's alert and oriented times three was the point of that there. So let me just go through this real quick. And I want to get this landed and get us all uh, respect everyone's time. This is important. This is geographic atrophy. I showed you a patient and I see us, uh, my colleagues and times kind of throw these back and forth, discoform scar and geographic atrophy. Geographic atrophy is subtracting. A discoform scar is maybe round. And how it got its name real quick is when people donated their eyes to science, they didn't know what this was. Whenever they peeled back the sclera and they peeled back the choroid and they were able to kind of tease this scar tissue out, you can't tease anything out when it's geographic atrophy. It's missing. It's absent. They got this discoform scar and they said it's a discoform scar. And what that tells you is that there was a bleed there at one time. So basically you can have a geographic atrophy and a discoform scar. Yes, you can have both, but don't call this a discoform scar. And the other one, don't call it geographic atrophy when you're you know, writing letters or talking to, to, to docs. And really this is the last case here. It's really quick. <laughs> Um, this is a case where this lady came in. I really wasn't sure what was going on. Um, so we put some doxycycline, did some Maxitrol, you know, Procares, Hydrocortisone, but really smacked her really, really, really hard with, uh, with the Zydra and uh, like, you, like probably more than we should have, but gave her some reassurance and she came back in 10 days and uh, she was really happy because she looked like this when she was all said and done. So uh, that was going back to the days when they were using uh, Jennifer as the uh, Zydra person. So I hope you guys uh, found uh, found tonight's uh, cases interesting. Hope to help you that you're able to really, again, get back to what the, the title says, improve eye care and outcomes and maybe think of things in a little bit different way. So I don't see any other questions in the chat box, Joe. So um, any final you comments? Your, your round of applause. So let's just, let's land this and uh, go about our nights. Okay. So thanks everyone for attending. This will end the CE portion.